This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 232. Welcome to the end of, almost the end of 2022. And Ben, I must say, this was an absolute blast guest to meet. Professor Anna Maria Lusardi. Wow, she started out off off uh, off camera when we first met her, showing us an award she won last night, which was just to see her excitement and the and the recognition for her career. It's incredible the energy that she brings to the topic of financial literacy was absolutely contagious. It was a fantastic interview. Uh, we learned a ton. She is so articulate. The experience she has in this and the impact. I mean, some of the notes I took down, Ben, just like. Financial advice is not a replacement for financial literacy. So interesting. A third of the world is financially illiterate. Only, sorry, yeah, only a third of the world is financially literate. Two thirds is financially illiterate. Um, financial literacy is critical when you ask her the question in happiness and having a good life. Oh, I loved her answer on that. I lo- that that was that was great. It was so interesting. Thirty yeah. to forty percent of the difference in someone's economic net worth is due to financial literacy. In, in retirement wealth. In, in retirement wealth. Yeah, yeah. That was just a brilliant conversation. I, I, I agree. I, I expected it would be when I, when I uh, found Professor Lusardi's research. I was blown away by the quality, the uh, influence, like the, the, the reach of her research. She, she's, her, she's authored or co-authored like all of the most cited papers on this topic. I said to her before we started recording, and she was she was very humble and told me not to not to you know exaggerate. But I, I I think it's true, and I can't get this out of my head that she is to financial literacy research what Jean Fama is to efficient markets. And I don't. She told me that's a, an overstatement. I don't know. I don't think it is. Uh, it, her 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 body of work is absolutely incredible mm-hmm. on this topic, and the passion that she brings to it is also incredible. Hundred percent. So she's the professor of economics and accountancy at George Washington University. She's the founder and academic director of the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center, and the co-chair of the G53 Financial Literacy and Personal Finance Research Network, the G53 Network. Before that, she was professor of economics at Dartmouth, where she taught for twenty years, and she has a PhD in economics from Princeton. Yeah. Yeah, an incredible career, incredible body, incredible body of work, uh, and and incredible area of research that's just so directly relevant to people. And like she she articulated this so well when we talked about when we talked about happiness, and she talked about how uh, when she asks her students what they think her course on financial literacy, which she teaches uh, at, at her current university, what they think it's about, and they usually think it's about investments, or they think yeah. it's about debt. And she tells them, no, this is, it's about happiness. Financial literacy is ultimately about happiness, about having the ability to choose in your life. I, I just thought that was an incredible explanation of what personal finance is and, and what financial literacy can bring to the, to the table, to somebody's life. I mean, clearly we, we believe this, right? I mean, that's why we do this podcast. But at the end, she talked about how taking care of your finances changes your life. And I think, you know what, like we, we would agree with that, which is one of the reasons we do this podcast, but I mean, I know this is anecdotal, but when you look at the stories that we hear from listeners of this podcast who have gone on this little journey with us where they've listened to a bunch of podcast episodes, they, the, the, the stories we've heard about how much it has changed people's lives. I, I, I don't think that it's a, an overstatement to say what she, what she said. Yeah. Anything else, Ben? I think we've put a pretty high energy <laughs> intro to this. <laughs> it was exciting. It was, it was ex- an I exciting, high Absolutely. energy episode. And for me, there was a ton of anticipation because uh, like people have heard us in the podcast recently talking about financial literacy on a few different occasions. Uh, after we did that podcast episode, I was asked to, to speak about it. Um, I'm actually doing that, that tomorrow. Uh, anyway, so I've spent a ton of time reading and research, and I think that comes out during the conversation uh, yeah, but you're right. Let's go ahead to the episode. Beautiful. Here is our conversation with Professor Anna Maria Lusardi. 
Professor Anna Maria Lusardi, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We're very excited to be talking to you. So to start off, Professor Lusardi, what is the definition of financial literacy? So we had to spend a lot of time defining financial literacy. And I have to tell you that we spent, I'm not kidding, probably an entire month or more to come up with a definition. And so now I'm going to read one uh, that we came up with. And this is, um, I'll read the definition first, and then I tell you why I think it's so important. And then I tell you, uh, you know, which, uh, which group was it designed to, even though it's very general. So um, we came up with this definition. Financial literacy is knowledge and understanding of financial concepts and risk and the skills, motivation, and confidence to apply such knowledge and understanding in order to make effective decisions across a range of financial concepts to improve the financial well-being of individual and society and to enable participation in economic life. Mm -hmm. Granted, this is a long definition, but I think it's important for several reasons. First of all, when it comes to financial literacy, it's not just a simple concept, but it's also the motivation and the skill to apply such concept. And um, the definition also points to the fact that financial literacy is useful because it brings financial, you know, better financial decisions. So it has that objective. Um, and third, and this is why I thought it was innovative, you know, it's not just for individual, but for society as well, something that I would like to discuss maybe throughout this podcast, why it is so important to have financial literacy, not just for the individual and to society. And finally, and we wanted to underline that we said it enabled participation in economic life. You know, so financial literacy is like being a citizen, uh, you know, having that knowledge that allows you to be a citizen. So interestingly, if you think it's very general, we came out with this definition uh, when we had to design questions for 15 years old. You mm -hmm. know, so we started with the young, but uh, it is a definition which I think is appropriate for everybody. And so if mm -hmm. I if I had to summarize it, it's basically financial literacy is that basic skill, like reading and writing, that we need today to participate to society. I, I like that you had confidence in there too. I, I picked that up from some of your papers that uh, the, a lot of the gender gap in financial literacy is explained by differences in confidence. That's it's interesting to see that in the definition. Yeah, no, we we try to be general, very general, and we saw that it is an important factor that you know hmm. you need the knowledge, but also the confidence to apply it, um, hmm. and that's particularly important for some group, as you have said, and we saw that as well. Um, but and also you know, financial literacy is something kind of beyond the simple uh, knowledge of concept. Um, and that's what we wanted to uh, make clear. And by the way, we have used this definition to then design a set of questions to then measure uh, financial literacy among the young. And frankly, we apply this concept to also measure financial literacy among the old. So, so that's, that's up my question, which is how do you actually measure financial literacy? <laughs> so it's not easy. Uh, and when we started many, many years ago, and it was almost by accident, we were told we only had three questions. Um, so, you know, um, you, might, you might know about our big three. Uh, so we started this uh, measurement of financial literacy back in, I think, actually, when we designed this question, it was 2002. And then they were added to our first uh, survey in 2004. Um, so, you know, when we actually had to write down, you know, the actual questions, we first of all realized that what we needed to do is look at the most fundamental concept. And this is also something we did uh, when we worked for the OECD in the previous uh, definition I mentioned, because you have to design measure that actually hold true also across countries. And so, um, you know, when you look at what are basically these concepts that you know everybody needs to have in order to make decisions? Then you have to really go to the most fundamental 
in a sense, concept. And this is why in our, for example, big three, we talked about interest compounding, you know, or calculation um, uh, of that concern interest rate. And, and so this is really something, of course, universal. We talked about inflation, it's critically important in financial decision-making because almost every financial decision has to do with time and risk diversification. So these concepts are at the basis of, of almost every financial decisions, and they are also universal. It's not that inflation is different across country. Inflation is the same thing. It's the increase in prices over time, and also risk diversification is the same concept across countries. And of course, you know, when you have more and more in uh, the PISA definition, we could uh, design 40 questions, then you can, of course, you know, be a lot more elaborate. Hmm. When, when you expand to more questions, what, what other types of topics are, are tested? So when we expand it to more, uh, this is where, you know, you become less and less uh, global because mm. many of the questions I think often have to do with, you know, potentially a specific uh, a country. So for example, uh, more recently with the TIA Institute, we designed what we call a personal finance index. And so this is an index that measure knowledge of personal finance, basic, mm. basically measure of the concept related to the decision that you make every day. Now, in that, you know, there are 28 questions, but in there we added questions about, do you know about 401ks, right? Do you know about uh, insurance contract? Do you know about, um, you know, specific financial instrument? Now this become, of course, now much less global, but it, but in a sense, you know, you could come up with a lot of sophisticated question, including, do you know the difference between a bond and a stock? Right. That's actually a pretty, you know, universal concept. Do you know about the inverse relation between asset prices and interest rate? Mm. Which, by the way, is a great way to measure whether people have a sophisticated knowledge. You know, oh. it's not that by reading the Wall Street Journal, you learn about this inverse relationship between bond prices and interest rate, right? You really have yeah. to understand this. Do you know, you know, like more sophisticated questions about the, the working of interest compounding? Can you do some of the calculation about interest compounding and so on? And this is, of course, very important when it comes to planning and also making you know, some calculation. I always argue to make some of the decision, you have got to do the calculation. You know, it's not that you can just come up you know, with your gut feeling. So how do you describe the current state of financial literacy when you look around the world? So we did a, a, a survey indeed, a global survey of financial literacy. So we have data for more than 140 countries. Mm. And we did that survey back in 2014 with the help of Gallup. And I think the way I would describe it is one word, which is dismal. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, that data reveal is that only one third of the population in the world is financially literate. One third, you know, if you think about this, that's a very um, low number in particular because uh, what we found, and I think that's a surprising result, is that many countries uh, with well advanced financial markets do not have, you know, even half of the population which is financially literate. And that to me is, a, you know, it's, it was a striking and very, um, I would say, uh, you know, I, I just want to put a, a warning about that finding, you know, um, in today's world, in particular, I think, you know, look at the fact of the crisis, you know, now we are back, you know, having inflation, people need to have that basic knowledge. And by the way, what we did measure is exactly that, the most simple knowledge. And it's surprising and striking, and I would say uh, dangerous that, uh, you know, such a large part of the population doesn't even have that basic knowledge. Um, and so, you know, that was, I think, the most important message, frankly, of that global survey. Do, do you know how financial literacy levels have changed over time? Like, are, they, are we getting better? 
So we don't know the answer to this question because even though that survey that we did in 2014 is the most cited survey, by the way, there is no week that goes by without somebody citing that survey, in particular, if they want to talk about financial literacy in a specific country, because for example, other, you know, other institutions have done surveys, but it's always, you know, 20 country or the G7 or the G20 or so on, but not a global survey. And so that global survey has not uh, has not been done yet again. And understand it is expensive, you know, to do a global survey. But I actually think it's even more expensive not to have that data. So if I look at countries for which we have data, so for example, mostly the U.S. and and I say that because, for example, our data collection, our, for the Personal Finance Index, started in two thousand and seventeen. So now we have six years of data. And if I look at other surveys, for example, the one of the regulator in the US, the National Financial Capability Study, we started in 2009. So now we have more than 10 years of data. And what we see is very little or no improvement over time, which is actually not surprising to me because it's not that you increase financial literacy just by watching the world around you. Um, you know, this is, so relatively sophisticated knowledge that um, it's not that you acquire it necessarily. In fact, that's also, I think, what we find when you look at the countries with the well-developed financial markets, they often do not have young people that are more financially literate than countries with less developed financial market, which again says if you live in a, if you're born in a rich country, it's not that you are automatically financially literate. So financial literacy is something that you have to acquire, in a sense, in school. Um, you know, it's like, can you can you learn, you know, your reading and writing just by yourself? I don't think so, right? Even reading and writing at the end of the day is not that simple. So, you know, uh, finance is not, is simple, but not that simple that you just learn by watching the world around you. What areas of financial literacy do people struggle with the most? Yeah, you know, I, I would not have been able to answer that question until recently when we did, for example, this personal finance index. Mm. And what we did find is that the area in which they struggle the most is basically risk and understanding risk. Mm. And it is investing and it is insuring. So actually, this might be useful for you in particular because that's, you know, where probably financial advisors operate the most. Um, and in many ways, you know, this is not surprising because if you think about what risk is, you know, that's that's a difficult concept, right? It's the second moment of a distribution. So it's not something so easy. And it's also, I don't think, something so intuitive. And um, and it's also interesting that also insurance is where people, um, you know, find the, where we see the lowest amount of knowledge and also investing. Um, and, you know, by the way, we have tried to come up with the simplest questions about investing, right? But nevertheless, this is the one, these are the, the topics that I think people find most difficult. And probably right, rightly so, because um, you know these are there are there is quite of a complexity behind that. I always tell my student that to explain why it's not a good idea to put all of your eggs in one basket, right? Just if I had to do the proof of that simple, you know, story, it's actually a long proof, mm. right? So you know. Mm. Uh, it's not, it's not so simple. And this is where people struggle the most. And I think this is also very consequential because, you know, risk have really increased a lot in our life, you know, from a macro risk, from, you know, climate change, from, um, you know, the pandemic, from health risk and so on. And so more and more Part of our life is how to edge against those risks, how to ensure, ensure against those risks. So, you know, these are important skills for us to develop and because we really do want not to be derailed uh, by, you know, uh, shocks happening to us. Interesting. So uh, do, do you think that the, the importance of financial literacy has, has increased over time? I do, and this is actually one of the reasons why we started this project. You know, when I mm. say we, is also 
with uh, several long-term collaborators from Olivia Mitchell to Peter Tufano to even collaborator in uh, Canada, for example, Professor Pierre Carmichaud. You know, and I, um, let me at least mention two or three of those reasons. Um, uh, you know, it might be very obvious, and I think some of them are, are also happening across countries. You know, one I think is um, really to do with the changes in the pension system. And, and more fundamentally is basically the change in demography, right? The fact that we live much longer and, and you know, there are less uh, young people, for example, people are having less children. This is putting enormous pressure on, uh, you know, the government and all of these uh, social insurance, you know, for example, almost every country has, has shifted toward the defined contribution type pension, but more and more people will have to at least, uh, you know, provide for part of their financial security at retirement. And I'm not claiming that, you know, these things are not going to go away, but they will be less generous. And um, so, you know, that I think is one of the fundamental reasons why we all need to be financially literate, even countries like China or even, you know, countries uh, that, you, you know, I mean, you don't need to be in a sense a G7 countries uh, for that. Um, the other, another question, the other reason is we see it is just the complexity of the financial instrument, you know, even a, even a mortgage is a very complex financial instrument now. So that complexity of the financial instrument has happened everywhere. I mean, think of, of any of how many mutual funds exist, right? And, and how many financial instruments exist with respect to the past. Um, the third thing, this is also related uh, to the US, but I think is happening in other countries, is the change in the cost of education. And so, you know, more and more people, um, you know, they have to make decision about a very important investment, which is the investment in education. But that education is becoming in some country much more expensive. And if you don't even go to the U.S., you know, going to college in uh, other countries as well is getting more and more expensive. And maybe you also want to be very deliberate about it. You know, do you want to go, which type of university do you want to go to? Well, in the US, you know, an average student is going to come up, come out of college with more than $30,000 in student loan. So young people start their economic life in debt. Think about this, that's a, that's a very, very big change. It means that very early on, in fact, you know, even when you are 15, before you make that college decision, you need to have at least some basic knowledge. Um, again, to come back to my definition, to understand the world around you and to participate to society. Um, so in making mistakes about some of those uh, decisions can be very consequential, much more than in the past. Hmm. So when you look at trying to explain the differences in the individual's economic outcomes, is financial literacy distinct from like other types of education like schooling? Yes, it is. It is because I think it's very specific. Uh, so it's a specialized knowledge, right? And the question is, do we need spe specialized knowledge, right? Should I, you know, if I teach more math at school, shouldn't be people be able to make financial decisions? And that's, I think, what some people have argued. And I actually think not, because by the way, financial literacy doesn't mean only being able to do the calculation, also means being able to know where to go and get sources of information. It means being able to decide whether or not you, you should consult a financial advisor. It, needs, it means also know where are your uh, rights and your obligations uh, and things like this. Um, and I think what we really see as well that, you know, it is, a, it is an additional piece of knowledge. You know, in almost all of our empirical work, we have seen that, for example, your level of schooling affects financial decision, but financial literacy affects financial decision above and beyond schooling. Right. So mm -hmm. just to give you an example, you know, if you are more financially literate, you are a lot more likely, for example, to invest in stock. You are a lot more likely to invest also in other assets. You are almost more likely, by the way, to manage that well. And you are also more likely to have precautionary savings. 
So above and beyond the level of education. So, you know, it's a specialized piece of specialized knowledge that is you know, particularly helpful in making decision in that in that specific area, which is financial decision making. That, that, yeah, that's so interesting. The, the the financial literacy is a specific form of of human capital. I think is yeah such an interesting concept. I I, I want to ask about one of your papers, which is a, just an absolutely fascinating paper that, on optimal financial knowledge and wealth inequality. Right. Can, can you talk about how you modeled the, uh, the the effect of financial literacy on retirement wealth inequality in that paper? Yeah. So what we try to do in this paper is basically show that financial literacy, like other form of education, is a decision that people make, right? Because um, first of all, it has financial literacy brings a, a benefit. Uh, and the benefit is you are better able, for example, to participate in a uh, in financial market. You are a, a better able to understand, you know, what the stock market is and, and does and, and how to use it as well. And this is indeed, you know, one of the main channels we use, uh, you know, in that model to say, well, you know, what are the benefits, frankly, of financial literacy? Well, you are better able to basically use a more complex financial instrument. And for us, in, you know, because this is a, um, in a sense, a, a straw model of reality is that it allows people to better invest and participate in the stock market. So to, you know, be- basically get a higher return on your wealth. Uh, and we recognize there are costs of financial literacy. You have to spend time and effort uh, and often, you know, pay uh, for uh, acquiring financial literacy. So what we wanted to show that every other decision, you know, including your investment in education, people make a rational decision on whether or not to go to college and compare the cost and benefit, the same is done in financial literacy. So recognizing that, you know, it's not that we expect 100% of the population to be financially literate, because we recognize that for some, the benefit of being financially literate might be very limited, right? If you feel like, well, I have a good pension, I don't need to save for my pension, I don't have a lot of money, so I I really won't be able or, or, or even wish for to invest in the stock market, it's not that I need to be you know, really financially literate. And so that model simply recognized that, that it is a rational decision. And that's why we say optimal, the word optimal financial knowledge and not by chance, you know, the paper was published in the Journal of Political Economy, you know, where, you know, we are really putting that rational spin, which we believe is what, you know, people do. They try to, to do the best in their financial decisions. But there is, I think, a really, really striking finding in that paper, and it goes beyond what we expected. Because we have a model, now we can see, but how much does financial literacy matter, right? I I think uh, I have met a lot of economists uh, that, uh, you know, expect or claim that financial literacy doesn't matter or that is not really relevant. And so we put that to test as well. You know, we have a model, we incorporated financial literacy in it in a very, uh, you know, uh, in the model that, all economists use to model financial decision, for example, saving decisions. And then we could determine, but how much does financial literacy matter? How much does it account, for example, for wealth in a clo- wealth, the differences in wealth close to retirement? And we found that from 30 to 40% of wealth at retirement is accounted by financial literacy. So I have to say, for those who think that financial literacy doesn't matter, think back, because, you know, this is, a, first of all, a very high number. But if you think about this, it's also not surprising. You know, in fact, you know, let's think of this um, situation, right? Um, so if, um, you, you know, if we are, you know, the same people and we might have the same income, we might have the same education, Right. But if I, you know, invest in stock and you don't invest in stock, right, in a few years, you know, 20 years later, we might indeed look very different. And so, you know, this is not a simple calculation. We incorporated a life cycle model, you know, with shocks and with all the 
you know, with all the, in a sense, sources of shock that people could face. And what we actually did show is that, you know, having access to financial literacy and therefore better investing in, uh, in the stock market brings large differences in wealth close to retirement. Yeah, I, I really like that paper. Well, one of the other things that I was thinking about when I read that one was that you're, you're talking about being able to access effectively higher expected returns by being financially literate. And I, in some of your other writing, I, I also found that I, I think you talk about how people with lower financial literacy also tend to pay higher fees in general. So that, that probably can, can contribute to the same, uh, the same effect. Yeah. yeah, so in, in this model, you know, we don't even take that into consideration. And that's why I think if we were to add, you know, these other uh, sources, I think probably we can do even more, mm. right? And so here with only one channel, right, with the fact that financial literacy allows you, in a sense, to get a higher return uh, on the market and therefore a higher return on your wealth, you can generate already a much higher a amount mm. of wealth for those who invest in financial literacy. So that's, I think, a pretty remarkable finding. Definitely. You, you touched on this, but can you expand on, on what determines the optimal level of knowledge? Like who, who shouldn't invest in financial literacy? Yeah, so here, right. you know, because our model is very stylized, lies, um, you know, we model very uh, several sources of uncertainty, but what the model really says in a sense here is that one of the main reasons for people to save is for retirement. This is in a sense, you know, for example, people save also for precautionary reason, right? But you don't need, you know, for precautionary reason, you don't save millions of dollars, right? It wouldn't be optimal to save millions of dollars for precautionary reason. You should probably buy insurance, right? So, the, the really big part of wealth often come for saving for retirement, in particularly now, uh, and also that's what we model in the in the paper that you know the replacement rate at, uh, of social security is probably in particular for a higher income people be around fifty percent. Mm. So you know you need to save quite a bit for retirement. So if it is the case, then you know the, the people who have in a sense, more of an incentive to save for retire to invest in financial literacy, going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, why we need financial literacy today is the people, you know, we love to save quite a bit for their retirement. So it's more optimal in a sense for, I would say, a high income person that has to save a lot for retirement to invest in financial literacy, potentially than a low income worker who has a very high replacement rate and so his saving for retirement is less, right? And so, you know, in, in, in that sense, we say part of the differences we see in society in how much people, you know, are financially literate, part of them is also rational because some people might not need to invest a lot in financial literacy if they don't need, for example, to make certain type of decisions. Having said that, you know, because this is, of course, a very stylized model, I would argue that today, almost everyone need to have at least the basic knowledge. Right. So this model is really about more the sophisticated knowledge that allows you to, you know, in a sense, um, access more sophisticated kind of financial instrument. You know, in the same way in which, you know, probably some people, you know, don't, don't invest in very, very complex financial instrument because they don't need to. Right, or they don't have the type of wealth to invest in very complex financial instrument. It, when, when you look at the global data, d does the optimal level of financial knowledge show up there? Like, for example, does a country with a stronger social safety net have lower levels of financial literacy? Yeah, actually, uh, this is not work we have done, but other people have done. It's very interesting that uh, mm. they show that the country which have the lowest level of financial literacy, for example, are also country with more general pension plans. Mm. And interestingly, for example, this might explain country like Italy, though my native country, where you know the level of uh, the the government. Uh, support or the government insurance has been quite high and, you know, the pension have been quite rich in the past. So people didn't really have to uh, probably invest a lot in their own financial knowledge um, for their own retirement. And, you know, but also for those countries, you know, things are now changing 
Mm. And in a sense, you know, they should also quick try to adjust to that because the reality, particularly for the young people, is going to be very different than the reality for their own parents. That is fascinating. Can you give us some numbers around how financial literacy affects stock market participation? Um, sure. And of course, the number really change a lot, depending on which country you look at. But we were able to look at this evidence, for example, for the Netherlands. And the reason is we have worked a lot with the Dutch Central Bank, and we have been able to estimate um, for example, uh, the relationship between financial literacy and participation in the stock market. We have done several studies as well in the U.S. as well. And what I can argue is that, you know, financial literacy is an important determinant of stock market participation. I cannot now pin down, you know, the, the very precise number because we have done, you know, many studies and, and across all the countries. But, you know, it is a it's not a, a sideshow. You know, people who are financially literate are indeed a lot more likely to participate in the stock market. So, in other words, knowledge is a very important factor um, for what, you know, for what relate participation in financial markets. And this is why, you know, I know that, for example, a lot of people are pushing for financial inclusion. They feel like, well, you know, if we have a good market, if we open markets or, you know, if we have a good financial system, people will participate to it. And I feel like, well, you know, think back, because in particular, when it comes to complex financial instrument, and I can tell you that, you know, a lot of people don't even know, it cannot define what a stock is. Um, you know, you can open all the market you want, but, you know, you need to have people to have that knowledge in order to participate to the market. And this is why, and I want to repeat it strongly, you know, if you want to promote financial inclusion, you have got to promote financial literacy. You know, market and financial instrument, offering people financial instrument is not enough. Hmm. Can, can you talk about the, the empirical side? So you talked about your model on retirement wealth accumulation. Empirically, how is financial literacy related to wealth accumulation? So um, many, in many ways. Um, so, for example, from the theoretical model, we even can pin down a number, right? We see that financial literacy can explain to from 30 to 40 percent of wealth accumulation at retirement. And we think is via the investment channel. So, in other words, financial literacy allows you to invest better and therefore to earn higher return, right? To basically take advantage of the equity premium puzzle to say it in finance. But I think there is another channel and that we have found in other study, which is that financial literacy allows people to plan more for retirement. And I think that planning can influence the wealth accumulation in other ways, meaning it can also influence how much you save, not just how you invest your wealth. Um, and I think, you know, what could potentially happen is when you start planning and you start setting objectives, then your consumption pattern might change, mm. right? And, and you know, you might indeed, by creating an objective, for example, maybe reduce your consumption, or I would say start saving early. You know, in many ways, that's actually the biggest suggestion, frankly, coming for personal finance, which is that if people were to start as early as possible, and I would say, you know, even well before, you know, you start, um, you start college or you start your education, you know, if, uh, if maybe, you know, parents or grandparents would, you know, start even putting money aside for their children, uh, you know, and early on, I mean, the power of interest compounding is very powerful and wealth can grow very, very uh, fast and high if you start, let's say, at age 15 or if you start as soon as you start working. Um, and that's why I think financial literacy is so essential for wealth accumulation. Can you talk about some of the common mistakes that financially ignorant people tend to make? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, as you know, mistakes are in the eye of the beholder, right? And so as um, as an economist, I always think that there are lots often, you know, many reasons why people don't do what, you know, we predict them to do. Um, but I think probably one of the 
you know, many things that we see today, I think potential mistake happen, I would say, on the debt side. And the reason is there is so much innovation uh, in debt, you know, and we have given people so many opportunity to borrow almost against everything, right? You can borrow against your human capital, you know, we are student loan, you can even borrow against your future paycheck, going to, you know, payday lender, you can borrow, you know, against your 401k, you can borrow against anything. Um, and so I think is, um, you know, because of that really huge supply, and because it's often shifted to individual to, uh, you know, to make those decisions, I think that's where potentially people make mistakes. You know, I would say in particularly in a country like the US that, you know, what people should be doing and perhaps they don't do enough is take care of their credit score, hmm. right? Because the credit hmm. score is almost a, a grade on your decisions and it affects, you know, the interest rate you're going to get, you know, on things like a mortgage. Like, you know, one po- even a 50 basis point difference on your mortgage is going to make a huge difference on the interest you're going to pay for that. You know, it's going to even affect whether you're able to rent an apartment and, and your employer will look at your credit score. And so, you know, that really knowing and taking care of your credit score, I think could be something very important on the debt side. The other things, and is related to what I, I was saying before, is that probably people don't start saving and planning for their future early enough. You know, that's like one of the things I always tell my student because people feel like retirement, what is retirement, right? But in fact, time, which by the way, is the asset that young all young people have. You know, all young people are endowed with an amazing asset, which is time. Use time on your side, on your favor, Right. And people say, I cannot save, but everybody can save. You know, even poor people, very poor people in poor countries are saving. So, you know, saving early can be quite important and quite useful. You know, you can take advantage of that. You know, so I think there are lots of opportunities um, that perhaps people are passing on, for example, taking advantage of employer uh, benefit, uh, taking advantage of uh, tax favor asset. Um, you know, taking advantage of financial markets, you know, if interest, I would like to see and probably people have done it and people have done some of this study that, you know, when interest rate go down, you know, it's really time to refinance mortgages. It's really time to take advantage of all of the opportunities of the markets, right? And in my view is also, if we look at the financial crisis, I think we have seen at least a, a, a two or three other mistakes in that in my view that people have made. So from the, I think, the 2008 financial crisis, we did see that people engage in mortgages they could not afford. And it's probably because these mortgages were incredibly complex, you know, much more complex that people, you know, were able to understand. You know, they they took, you know, convertible, uh, adjustable rate mortgages with very low teaser rates and so on, not understanding that these things would you know, change very quickly, and then they couldn't bet or really on the housing market always going up. The second thing that we have seen is people don't put aside precautionary savings Mm. or enough. You know, one third of the population, according to our study, wouldn't be able to face a $2,000 shock in in a month time. So let alone the shutdown of the economy, right? And this is actually not a small proportion. So, you know, crisis, I think, also reveal um, that, you know, when it comes to our personal finances, I think we can do much better. Hmm. So the the paper you just mentioned is on uh, financial fragility. I I read that one, too. Uh, Canada actually has a social survey that the government's been doing where they they look at uh, financial fragility as a predictor of other factors like well-being and happiness. What, What role do you think financial literacy plays in happiness, broadly speaking, and and living a good life? I think a critical role. And I always tell my student that that's the that's the role of financial literacy, right? And that's the role of make of finance in general. It's not that you know we should take of um you know financial literacy and of finance, you know, to save more and borrow less. 
right? What we do, you know, our final objective is to be financially secure, to live a happier life, a, ha- a life where we are free to choose. That's the really fundamental role of financial literacy. And that's the fundamental role of making good financial decision because that's the, that's the objective. So I want to t- tell you an anecdote. Um, you know, when I, as, as I've been teaching personal finance for uh, since 2013. And so, you know, the first uh, uh, question I ask my student in the first class is, what do you think this course is about? Right, because this course, this call uh, is um, this course was used to be called personal finance. Okay, I can tell you that almost all of my students thought that the course was about investing, hmm. investing in the stock market. This is what they identify personal finance with: investing in the stock market. More recently, some people have said, "I hope it's also about student loan." <laughs> you know, so it's about. But mostly students identify, as many people, personal finance with investing or debt. And what I tell them is like, no, this is a happiness project. Mm. This is a course about learning the skills and the knowledge that allows you to, you know, be happier, to be more financially secure, um, to make the decision you really want to make. I, I I love it. That's that's such a such a important and, and strong point to make. I, I, a question that I had, and I know you've, you've got some writing on this too, but a, a question that I think anybody would have going through a lot of your research is how do we know which way the causal relationship goes? Like we we can see that there's a relationship between financial literacy and economic outcomes. How do we know which way? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's a very uh, fundamental question, and this is um, why. You know, in particular, when we look at the effectiveness of financial education, now we have to turn to experiment, to randomize control trial, right? And because of the paper that we just discussed that, you know, financial literacy is a choice, right? And so, um, you know, it's endogenous itself, right? So we, you know, it's very hard to take a variable as exogenous, And so what we do in order to assess this, you know, we can do experiment, where we take two different groups and we expose one group, for example, we give them more financial knowledge and, and then we study how this group, which is very similar to another group to, to, to which we do something else, behave later on, like you know, doctors do when they try out different medicines. And this is, by the way, what uh, we have also, you know, many, many uh, people do, ourselves have also been doing. And I think that's also, uh, we need that to also assess, not just whether financial literacy works and in which direction, but also to find good way to make it really effective and work mm. in, in work well for also different groups and so on. And very, we did, in fact, recently a meta-analysis trying to assess whether indeed, you know, financial literacy and education works, because first of all, you know, we need to uh, understand if there is a causal effect and, and how much financial literacy matter. So it is possible, in other words, to assess mm-hmm. that causal relationship. What role do you think financial advice, and I guess financial advisors, play in helping people make better financial decisions? So it's a very difficult decision um, here because... Um, you know, I think the literature is not very clear on that. Uh, and I think there is quite a bit of evidence uh, that shows that, you know, financial advisor not do not necessarily, some you know, bring a better uh, outcome for individuals. And, you know, what I can say from the research on financial literacy is that, you know, if you think that financial advice is a substitute for financial literacy, is actually the opposite. It is a compliment. In other words, it's the people who have high financial literacy who consult financial advisor, Mm. right? And and I would argue that it's the people who have higher financial literacy that can better use financial advisor. So I always refer, there is a survey done many, many years ago, uh, and I think it was um, a survey done by Ibri or or a survey within the consumer... um, uh, some some um, uh, 
survey that looking at worker in firms. And the question was basically whether, you know, if they were offered an advice for free, whether they would take it. And interestingly, many workers said they wouldn't. They wouldn't even, you know, mm-hmm. use a free financial advice. Um, and other that would use that advice argue, yes, I would do, I would use the advice if it conforms with my, you know, with my thought and, and my mm-hmm. view on that. Right. So in other words, uh, I think, you know, in particular, people who are not financially literate might buy, might be very afraid of consulting a financial advisor because they are consulting on something they really don't know. And, and perhaps they might not fully understand or appreciate. Um, and it might also say, and this is why sometimes financial advice doesn't work, is because when people go to an advisor, they are not really looking for advice. They are looking for somebody, you know, saying yes to mm. their own, maybe, you know, uh. prior. And so, you know, in other words, if you are wrong and your financial advisor doesn't take you away from that wrong decision, then it doesn't help you. Uh, but, you know, if you are really wanting to confirm your bias, then, you know, then, you know, there is no help. Hmm. Yeah, there's been some super interesting research on, I think the, the paper was the, the the misguided beliefs of financial advisors or something like that. That Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I want to move on to demographic groups and the relationship to financial literacy. How, how does financial literacy vary across groups like like age, gender, uh, and, and even race? Yeah. So it varies a lot. Um, and interestingly, it varies in you know very similar way across countries. And I want to start with uh, um, a, a difference we have studied a lot, and um, and it's very pervasive. And I'm talking about gender differences in financial literacy. So our global survey basically tells us there is a gender difference in financial literacy around the world. Hmm. So there is, you know, in other words, women, um, when we look at their financial literacy, almost everywhere, no less than men. And in the places where there is no gender difference, normally it's because the level of literacy is, you know, solo also among men, that Hmm. there is no difference, um, you know, between men and women. So it was striking to see um, that if you, you know, ask this question, you get the same answer, you know, irrespective if you ask it in a G7 country or in a BRICS country or in the G20 and so on. And what we do see, and I want to come back to the definition we started with, is that women disproportionately answer the financial literacy questions with, I do not know. So it's not that, in other words, women are always wrong on the question, and that's why they are less financially literate, but they answer with, I do not know. So they do not know doesn't mean that they are wrong. They mean that they are perhaps more willing to say, I actually am not sure 100% about the answer to this question. And this is something we investigated in one of our work, and we were able to indeed pin down the fact that, you know, women are less confident than men in their answer. In other words, even men do not know, but they are are more willing to, in a sense, choose at random. Um, And what we found is, you know, as much as one third of that gender difference in financial literacy is actually explained by difference in confidence. And this is important to say because, you know, this is another way in which perhaps we can, you know, make uh, or design financial education programs which are more effective by fostering not just knowledge, but also confidence. And that's, for example, what I do in my class, Um, you know, how I, for example, teach some of the courses. Hmm. There is also a a big gender difference uh, across race. And we see that, for example, if you look at the U.S., where we do see a lot of racial differences, financial literacy is particularly low, for example, among African-American, but it's also particularly low among Hispanics. And if you look within Hispanics, for example, it's much lower for Hispanic, which have been born abroad, versus Hispanics, which have been born in the U.S. So, you know, like the differences are very nuanced, and I think it's important to recognize them. And there is a big difference, of, of course, between young and old. Some is simply age, right? I mean, you are young and therefore you don't know. Mm. 
but some is also related to the fact that, you know, yeah, the experience is very different across countries. So it's very interesting that if you look at the global survey, um, what you see in some countries is that financial literacy is much higher among the young than the old, right? Mm-hmm. Because the young today in some of the country might have, you know, better access also via technology to knowledge than that older generation. And it also means that that older generation didn't even have to be literate, right? In some of the country that financial literacy potentially, you know, was very low, not to mention literacy itself was very low, and this is different, you know, for the young. So there is a big divide between, for example, emerging country and in uh, a richer country when it comes to the young. But I think it is worrisome, and let me say the word worrisome, that, you know, financial literacy is so low among the young because the young today have to make a lot of financial decision at a very early age. Mm. And so, you know, I think we need to make sure that the young today are better equipped than you know, older generation were to deal with a very different economic environment. Other than confidence, does anything else explain the gender gap? Um, yes, I think there have to be a lot of factors, right? Because I mean, the, the confidence only explain one third, right? Mm-hmm. And so we think is, you know, in some of the study we have done is almost uh, uh, something about related to culture, Right or related to the fact that women, you know, in very traditional society, might not be asked to make some of these financial decisions, uh, and that you know, finance is also considered a field, right? Where, you know, this is not a field or that where there are lots of women um, or women make some of those decisions, you know. And and I think here there is a, a basic confusion because a lot of people say, but you know, in many families, it's the woman that makes financial decision. And I think this has to be qualified. Uh, in a lot of families, indeed, women make the financial decision making, but mostly the day to day or the short term financial decision making. While decisions like investing, you know, buying a house and so on are often, you know, maybe shifted or done by the, by the, you know, if there is a married couple, potentially by the male spouse and, and things like that. And so, I think when it comes perhaps to the you know world of uh, finance you know we also need to fight stereotypes or the fact that you know this is a field where women feel uncomfortable or they don't make this decision and they shouldn't be in charge of making this decision and by the way this doesn't explain everything because we still see a gender difference among uh, for example um young people also non-married people. So, you know, if you look at the single women versus single men, you know, there is still that gender difference. So I think, you know, it has deep roots. um, And that's why I think to me, the best way to address this gender difference is to have financial literacy in school, Mm. give access to everybody. Because otherwise, I think this, this, you know, typical role of women in society are going to, you know, in a sense, perpetuate itself and continue to perpetuate also a gender gap in financial literacy. I want to, I want to go more into into that financial education. Get, what can you talk about the evidence that financial education programs actually help improve outcomes? Yes, now I can because uh, we did a meta-analysis looking at evidence of financial education in 33 countries Mm -hmm. and looking only at the more rigorous studies, the one I was mentioning earlier, which are basically randomized control trials. So in other words, uh, really program in which uh, we could assess causality. And in in which you know we can say these are the golden star the gold standard in a sense of evaluation. I think that meta analysis was very clear in indicating that financial education works. And interestingly, we found that it works across age group. You know, we were thinking that you know it would be more effective among the young, but in fact, we find an effectiveness also among the old population. We were thinking it would affect you know, mostly the richer countries, because in the, you know, less rich country, there are less resources, and we found it is effective there as well. So I could argue, you know, given that study, that 
there is, I think, a lot of evidence that financial education work. This was contrary to earlier work. But I think if you look at that earlier work, what was there is was a very, very limited set of studies. Now we have so much more evidence. And also, I think, you know, often the financial education was very limited. You know, if, as I've mentioned, there is such a high level of financial illiteracy and you give, you know, a one hour seminar or you give, uh, you know, just a, a, a a very small intervention, you know, a very limited intervention, of course it doesn't work, right? Mm. I mean, if you give, uh, you know, aspirin to somebody who has pneumonia, you know, the fact it doesn't get better doesn't mean that traditional medicine is not effective. It means that the medicine was not adequate to the disease. And this is, I think, what's happening today. You know, we can't expect financial literacy to increase by itself. You know, we need to, you know, and this is a suggestion to government, policymaker, and employer. You know, we need intervention to make a difference, to you know, improve the level of financial literacy. It's not going to improve by itself, but it is clear that it works. And in our study, we also find it is cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, for those who think like it's expensive, I would say it's expensive not to do it. Right. So where should that education take place to be optimal? I, I like what you said, uh, to be optimal. I think there are two places which are ideal conduit of financial education. One, clearly, is the school. And it is the school because this is how you can reach all of the young. Um, and in particular, you can reach the group who need it most, which are the most vulnerable group, and which are the one who will not get it at home. If you look now, or who is financially literate in almost all country is a disproportionate group, which is very small, and is mostly composed, if you look at the PISA data, for example, of 15 years old, these are basically male, um, male student from college educated family or rich parents. You know, people learn financial literacy at the dinner table, but many, many young people are not exposed to parents who have that financial knowledge. So we need to put it in the school because that's where everybody is. And that's where I think everybody can access to education. And if you tell me, you know, curriculum are too crowded, well, we can actually add financial literacy in some of the topic in math, in history, in social science, in right. citizenship. Mm. Um, I would add it, I think it's very helpful to add it as a separate course and many states in the US are doing so. And I would actually argue that the prime minister in a country actually should call the education minister because I tell you the cost of that financial illiteracy is going to weight very high on the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, think of the cost of financial crisis. It has been enormous with respect to doing prevention. The second place where I think it's ideal to have it is the workplace. Um, because that's where the adults are. Many of the adult are at, adults are at work. You might argue why the employer should do financial education. So we did a survey recently in our personal finance index. We asked people how many hours they spend per week dealing with and worrying about their personal finance issues. And how many of those hours are at work, spent at work. The number you know, were quite high given that this was a self-reported measure. On average, Americans spend seven hours per week dealing with their personal finances. So this actually tells you about, you know, potentially the advantage of consulting a financial advisor. If you spend seven hours, multiply that by your wage, you know, it seems a bit an expensive way to spend your time. But three of those hours are at work per week. Wow. Okay, multiply this by the minimum wage. Let's take the minimum wage at 15. If, if for an employer, it costs less than $45 per week to do a personal finance program, which I can assure you there are many programs that cost less than that, I think it would be advantageous for an employer to also do financial education. Um, so, and I think, you know, again, there would be an advantage. I have to say, 
I have written uh, a paper that argues we should mandate financial education in the workplace. And believe me, as an economist, the word mandate, right, is like, uh, you know, um, I am proud to say mandate because when it comes to financial education, coming back to my previous point, if there is a crisis, as a taxpayer, I'm asked to pay for it. So, you know, I prefer to pay less and I prefer to have, you know, a wider access to everybody. So, you know, we can all have some of that basic knowledge that allows us to at least, you know, not go into deep financial troubles so much, so deep that even the taxpayer are asked to do that. So, you know, there are some fields in which mandate are not so bad after all. Hmm. So y- y- you talked about some some policy level initiatives and workplace in- initiatives just now. What about at the individual level? What can people who are listening to this podcast who will probably by nature of being listeners to our podcast be more financially literate than than average, what can they be doing to increase the financial literacy of people around them? Um so first of all, I have some suggestion for them as well, and then for doing something for uh, for someone around them. So, you know, my big suggestion to everybody is take good care of your finances. You know, in the same way in which you take care of your health, take care of your finances, because mm-hmm. it don't take care by itself, right? We live in a world in which we spend a lot of money um, to actually induce people to consume, as I tell my student, you know, as as you know, if they go when they go out from their classroom, you know, in the two blocks or three blocks to reach their dorms, they have lots of you know incentive to buy, but nobody's telling them to save, mm-hmm. and nobody's telling them sometimes to take good care, right, of their finances. So this is a suggestion for everybody: take good care of your finances. Spend a little bit of time each week, probably not seven hours. It seems a lot of hours to me, but spend at least, you know, maybe, um, you know, an hour a week to actually take care of your finances, which means, you know, um, think of your financial situation. Think of your objective, set your objective of what you'd like to do and then try to follow up. And I think it's also helpful, you know, to look at your financial situation, you know, understand where you are and whether this is a good place where to be. And from there, you know, make some of those decisions which are very, very helpful. And by the way, I always say that these type of things, you know, save people money. You know, you might realize that, you know, you might keep in your money into, you know, an allocation which is not good for you. You might actually be not even using well your checking account. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you might, you know, there, there might be a lot of way to save and get more money, um, you know, and do better in your financial decisions, right? That there might be subscription you don't really need. And if you're not going to the gym and your gym costs $200 a week, think about it and all of those things, right? I mean, there is really a lot. I always say financial literacy puts money into your pockets. Um, so, you know, take advantage of that. But, and I love what you have said, You know, we also need to look at our community because I can assure you that, you know, we are not provided that financial education that we need. And I think all of us, for example, can advocate for financial literacy in our local school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, take that initiative. You know, often, um, you know, in in several places, there are these opportunities to do that. And if it is not... If it is not offered at the school, can it be offered in your community? There are also a lot lot of community center, right? And this could be, you know, a way in which we can help our community do better. Because I, and I tell you this because I am convinced and I've seen it in my students, I've seen it in our studies, that financial literacy changes people's lives, that it is that consequential, that it is that helpful. And so, you know, if we have a healthier, you know, more financially secure community, we can all do better. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's a win-win for everybody. And we don't have, you know, to pay even the cost that derive for, you know, potential financial crisis or for people around us not doing as well. So, you know, there there is a role 
for us as well to take in making sure that we can help people around us. What do you think about the argument that this is not a problem that should be solved with financial literacy education, but instead with financial product design? So this is a, this is a, I have heard this comment for 20 years. So, you know, it's what people argue all the time. And let me start with the combustion engine uh, analogy. We are not asking people to become financial expert. That's the point. You know, it's not we are asking people to become Warren Buffett. Um, you know, we are asking people, when I mean financial knowledge, is to have that basic knowledge that allows you to understand what the stock is, how the credit card work, what the FICO score is. Mm. I can assure you, in finance, ignorance is not bliss. Um, so, you know, and all of the study shows that financial literacy is very consequential. It's very consequential, not just for rich people, but for poor people as well. Because again, you know, if you don't have that knowledge, you know, the, the, the next thing you do is to go to the payday lender or, you know, not to, uh, to end up potentially in even more financial difficulties. And I think the financial crisis have told us about the huge, huge cost that individual and society have to pay for financial literacy. So, you know, I, I really, uh, I would say, push these people to look at what has happened and don't tell me that, you know, that uh, that has not been a huge cost, hmm. uh, number one. And I think, you know, number two, I really don't think that there is a, an alternative to financial knowledge. You cannot solve the problem of financial decision-making by offering good product or choice architecture. You can solve a financial, one specific financial decision, but, you know, financial decisions are interrelated. And so you might make people to save for retirement by automatically enrolling people into pension. But at a certain point, for example, these people have to know how to, to decumulate the wealth. Mm. And we might find solution for that as well. But in the meantime, they might have taken the wrong mortgage. So their financial situation is actually not, you know, well. And I actually particularly want to mention, particularly in the world, for example, of retirement saving, right? We have thought, what a great solution to automatically enroll people into pension. You know, we have, we can solve the pension. Look what has happened. First of all, people um, often stick at the very low uh, rate at which they are automatically enrolled into. People are borrowing against their 401k. There is an enormous leakage mm. in those accounts. When people leave their job, then they withdraw their retirement savings, right? Mm. And so, yet again, you know, it doesn't look like that there is that financial instrument are so clever that people are doing the right things. And the reason fundamentally is because we are all very different when it comes to financial decisions. Hmm. You know, so there is not this one size fits all. There is not that financial instrument that makes my life better off, right? I'll have to make those decisions and those decisions are very specific and individual. And for me to make good decision, I need to have some basic knowledge, in particular today. You know, I don't need to know you know, I don't need to know, uh, the, and I don't need to price convertible bonds. Um, so I don't need to know the black shoal formula, but I need to know what an interest rate is and mm. how, you know, what a FICO score is. And I need to have that yeah. basic knowledge. Otherwise, I don't think I'm going to do well. Um, and, and I think the, the crisis has told us that financial knowledge is very important for individual and for society as well. Mm. Great perspective. Our final question for you, Professor. How do you define success in your life? Yeah, um, everybody has their own definition. But, you know, for me, success is to be free to choose. Hmm. You know, to have that, um, you know, capacity to, um, you know, make the choices I want. And, uh, and I, if I have to, um, you know, say something about myself, you know, because at the end, uh, personal finance is personal. I think I have, uh, you know, because I am studying this topic, I have been uh, very, um, 
I've made two investments, which uh, were very important to me, and I make them uh, in, a, in, 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 you know, a very um, consequential way. Um, and and I thought it was uh, uh, something that I thought was an important thing to do. One, and I think the investment that has brought to me the higher return was the investment in education. Um, and so I don't think I would have, for example, this uh, uh, lifestyle and, and probably the satisfaction in my life if I had not invested in uh, my PhD in economics. And that was a very deliberate decision um, to, first of all, pursue a really good education. So as you know, I have, was born in Italy, in case you thought my accent was from Boston. Um you know, so I deliberately chose to come to the U.S. and I deliberately, you know, work very hard and study very hard to apply to some of the best uh, university in the U.S. And uh, and I've stayed in the U.S. because I thought that was the best uh, job market and environment to have a good career. And so my investment in education, I think, has paid a good rate of interest. And I've also got a good rate of interest for my financial investment. And, and I think I've been able to make those financial investment uh, deliberately because I had that knowledge, because I had, I was an economist studying economics, and then I pursue an interest as well in personal finance. And without that knowledge, it's not obvious to me that would I, I would have achieved the type of financial comfort that I can afford now. So, um, you know, these are... If I, you know, can give a suggestion at the end, you know, you you have to invest, um, you know, certainly you have to grow your wealth over time, particularly now with this high rate of inflation and think of those two investments. You know, one is uh, the best uh, way, the best investment that fits your need and specific circumstances. I was, uh, I invest very early on, so I could really take risk. I was very concerned about, you know, fees, commissions, and, and so on, uh, but also invest in uh, education as well, because it can also bring a high, a good rate of return. It certainly did for me. <laughs> Professor, this has been a wonderful hour. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really great. Thanks so much, Professor Lizardi.